Hello, everyone. I think can uh, can people hear me? Uh, John, can you give me a thumbs up if, if I'm coming through? Fantastic. Uh, sorry, I'm getting getting uh, having a few Zoom hiccups this morning, but uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. It's fantastic to see uh, so so many people um, here today. But um, look, first first of all, massive thanks to to Jane and everyone over at the Diversity uh, Project. It's fantastic to be doing our first webinar together and to be a part of the amazing and important work that you've been doing. I've been really impressed with everyone that I've met so far and how passionate um, how passionately your your members and and all of the different people who are involved take such a such a big task which is obviously driving diversity and and inclusion in um in, in their companies so thanks for everyone for joining us um of course and uh and i hope that this is an informative but also practical session for you um to start making or continue making changes within your organizations so hello everyone there is a chat section if you'd like to say hi and uh, maybe share share where you're from or where you're watching the the webinar from there's also a q a box which we'll be able to see as panelists but which the, the the rest of the attendees won't be able to see please do pop any questions that you've got for us in there and we'll do our best to get to those as we as we go and as we um, as we uh, talk in the in the webinar, or there's a, a section at the end of all of our talks um, that we will definitely make sure that we get all of those questions in. There's going to be we're going to send through a feedback form as well, and I'd really appreciate it if if everyone could make an effort to fill that in. It's really helpful for us to understand how well the content's been received, as well as whether there are any particular areas that, that you'd like us to to um, focus on in the future. So please do fill that one in. So today we are lucky enough to be joined by three expert speakers. So our very own Sophie Easter is going to get us started by talking us through some of the some of the steps that we take with um, a new talent partnership and you um, uh, company that we start working with around building the right foundations for diversity um, and r removing bias from the assessment process as a whole and talking around some of the theory and scientific method that we use behind that. Then Mark Fried is the founder of E2W, which is a community and recruitment agency for women in finance. Mark's going to chat through, talk us through some of the challenges that are specific to investment management and how to overcome them. And he's drawing on 20 years of experience in that company as well. And he's also going to be taking, talking us through what companies can do to attract more diverse, experienced candidates. Finally, we've got Joanne and Lauren from Schroders, and they're going to talk us through their early careers program, specifically some of the technology that they've used to create a level playing field there. But before all of that action packed agenda, I'm going to get us started by introducing Instant Impact and, and setting the scene as, as we see it. So for those of you who don't know us yet, Instant Impact are in-house recruitment specialists, and we work with our clients to make high quality, diverse hires directly and to successfully execute recruitment strategies around the, around the organization. Now, I, I hardly need to tell everyone here the huge amount of change that businesses have had to undergo since Marge. In, in our world of recruitment and talent, the two major changes that have had a big effect on, on us and on our clients have been a shift to remote working during the COVID pandemic and the increased momentum that uh, behind diversity and inclusion, which has followed the Black Lives Matter protests earlier, earlier this year. And it's, it's actually the intersection of these two changes um, that we see as presenting a unique and really interesting opportunity for businesses that are looking to hire candidates from more a more diverse background and that's that's what I'd like to explore first of all so we're undergoing a time of change that's unprecedented in most of our lifetimes uh, companies are re-examining the way that they look at, at talent really across the board so everything from whether employees need to work in the office um, 
uh, what skills we need in this new world and how, how we can keep our, co our company culture, company values um, in, in, in the organization. And as companies ask and answer these tough questions in 2021, we're really expected expecting to see a period of sustained and significant change. Secondly, although HR have long been driving an agenda of, of improving diversity and inclusion, that's really become a board level concern following the Black Lives Matter protests earlier, earlier in the year. Now, financial services companies have long been aware of the issues posed by having, uh, by being a, a male dominated industry. Um, but, but now that conversation is starting to evolve to take ethnic diversity much more seriously in, in more and more companies. Uh, but we're seeing a, a strong diversity policy should be broader than that and encompass disability, neurodiversity, sexual orientation, socioeconomic diversity as well. Um, and unfortunately, as, as I'm sure most of us know on this webinar, uh, financial services doesn't do amazingly well across the board in that. But these are finally conversations that are happening at pace and at the most senior level. Uh, finally, there's been a monumental shift towards remote working. Many companies are planning to become remote first. Others are adopting a mixed approach, uh, offering flexibility to work at home or from the offices, or from, the, from their offices. But even companies that do plan a full return to the office will have realized how effective a remote team can be. And this could, in the right companies have a huge knock on um, a benefit to diversity and allow companies to hire all over the UK, all over the world, even if they're even if they're majority UK based in, in terms of their client base and the work that they do. But that means that they'll be able to tap into a much broader talent pool. Um, and that will have fascinating implications for, for diversity across the board. And just to give a couple of examples uh, for socioeconomic uh, mobility, there are um, Areas, areas in the UK where there's particularly high unemployment, areas where people struggle to get to professional uh, jobs, maybe without great transport links. So really interesting ability to tap into that if a company embraces remote working technology. And then also for hiring disabled and neurodiverse people who often struggle uh, with a difficult commute or, or to be in a busy work environment. So enabling uh, businesses to bring in people from different, uh, from different backgrounds. So, all in all, that's a long way of saying that I really do think that we've never had as good an opportunity as we do right now to make change. So I thought it might be helpful as well to have a quick overview of Instant Impact's methodology for driving diversity through recruitment. We approach it across three core competencies, and you'll hear a lot of on all three of those today, um, but we do have video modules that separate on all of these, just detailing our, our methodology. So if you'd like any more detail on that, uh, my colleague Frankie is going to share those links in the in the chat now. They're sort of recorded on on YouTube, uh, but they're influencing internally, and that's getting everyone aligned with your diversity strategy from your most junior recruiter all the way up to the to the CEO. It's making sure you're attracting a diverse pool of candidates, which covers everything from your job board strategy to your returners policy and making it easy for uh, parents to come back to to come back to work, for example. And then also ensuring that your selection process offers equal opportunities to all candidates. And that's uh, making sure that your interviewers are trained all the way through to the technology that you use to, to underpin that. Now. I know that Mark's going to cover how to create internal buy-in and uh, what investment management companies can do to attract a more diverse talent pool. But before any of that, it's critical to have an assessment process that creates a level, level playing field. After all, it doesn't matter how diverse the candidates that you're bringing, that you're attracting are, if they get discriminated against and if they don't succeed in, in an, because of your outdated process. So. Um, Sophie's going to start off and, and run you through some of our methodologies. Sophie's one of our senior talent partners um, and she's going to talk you through how we approach removing bias. And just so, so you know, um, I know that Joanne and Lauren are going to really give us a drill down and give us an example of how that works on their graduate program to finish their early careers program to finish off the, um, uh, the webinar. So I'm going to stop sharing now and it will seamlessly transition to Sophie. I hope.
Sophie is on mute. Okay. There you go. You're <laughs> Thanks so much for the introduction, Felix. Um, great to be here today um, talking to you about removing bias from uh, interview processes. So I'm going to first of all provide a general overview of what we consider at Instant Impact to be best practice and what we normally recommend to our clients who are mostly medium-sized businesses making between anywhere from 20 to 200 hires each year. Um, before we even start attracting candidates and deploying the sorts of strategies that Mark's going to run through, we want to try and make sure that the assessment process creates a level playing field for all. So I know, as Felix said, that Joanne is going to run through more details on how Schroders have actually already implemented some of these kinds of principles into their graduate programme. But I'm going to start off today um, by discussing the problem. So what is the problem? Well, we think it's illustrated really nicely by a study conducted by Doris Wieselbarmer from the Institute of Labour Economics in Germany. So some of you may have seen these photographs before, but in a um, piece of field research that Dorit, Doris conducted, um, she applied to a wide range of jobs using almost identical CVs. So the only thing that she changed on the three CVs that she used to apply were her name and the photograph. So she started off on the left with the really um, German sounding and looking Sandra Bauer, um, and then she replaced the name with a Turkish sounding Mayam Ustürk, and finally changed the photo to um, a picture of her wearing a headscarf. So the results from this were really quite remarkable. As you can see um, the numbers here, um, Sandra Bauer received interview requests for 19% of her applications, whereas Mayam Ustürk, with exactly the same profile, um, besides the name, received interview requests for just 14%. It then um, diminishes even more when she changed the photo um, to a picture of herself wearing a headscarf. The CV was otherwise unchanged and Mayim took then received interview requests for just 4% of her applications. Um, I mean, the numbers speak for themselves. They're really rather shocking. And it means that um, Mariam would have to apply for five times as many jobs as Sandra to get the same amount of interviews. Now that's just from looking at a name and a picture before you even consider the bias throughout the rest of the um, screening process. So it's really clear from this study that despite having exactly the same experience and skills, Mariam and Sandra are not operating on a level playing field at all. So names and photos are obviously the first thing that most people see on a CV, um, but there are so many other areas that bias can creep in when we're screening CVs. So if we take um, a CV like Robert's here, for example, I'm gonna talk you through um, the other opportunities for bias to creep in. So the next thing after name and picture that we tend to look at is somebody's work experience. So this is where the halo effect comes into play. So the halo effect is when we infer ability from association with a previous employer. Now, in the case that you can see here, um, Robert works at Google, well, worked at Google actually, he's left, but um, we can make the assumption from this that Robert must be a strong candidate because he's worked at Google without really knowing what he did there, or if in fact he was a good hiring decision for Google in the first place. This ties in to confirmation bias, where we've already made the decision that Robert's likely to be a good candidate um, from working at Google. So then we look for things on the CV to confirm what it is we think we already know. So typically, if we see a three month tenure from a candidate, we'd often have question marks about why they were there for such a short period of time. But what we do, what we can do here is infer that there must be a good reason for, for Robert to leave Google um, if he was hired there in the first place. So those are the first two. Um, moving on, we can start to look at affinity bias. So we all tend to, to like people more who are similar to us, do the same things as us, have the same hobbies and interests. Um, and affinity um, bias is where we unconscious, unconsciously tend to go along or recommend people who are in fact similar to us. So as you can see here, Robert completed the Prince II qualification. So if you had also completed this qualification and you know how hard it is or how much it's helped you in your role and what you're doing, it's likely that you'll have a positive assumption around Robert as a, as an, as a reflection of this, um, rather than his um, ability or uh, you know, probing further into it. 
The next one is stereotype bias that we can find often when screening CVs. And there are two types of stereo bias that I'd like to talk about here. Um, the first one being, here we can see Robert studied at Cambridge. Therefore, we decide that he must be smart and, and good for this role. Or slightly more damagingly, looking at the dates, we may make the assumption that he's too old for the role. Um, the last thing, or the last type of bias we find um, when screening CVs is something that we call groupthink. Now, this is more in relation to where the CV actually came from. So if your manager, for example, told you to review Robert's CV or said, oh, he looks like a really great candidate, um, you're more likely to agree before having even reviewed the CV yourself. So what can we do to eliminate these types of bias from our processes? So rather than attempting the absolutely mammoth task of trying to train all of your employees out of their unconscious bias, we at Instant Impact work really closely with our clients to try and create a really fair assessment process that is both predictive of in-role performance and creates a level, level playing field for all of those applying. So I thought I'd spend some time this morning um, talking you through how we'd go about it. So first of all, I wanted to talk about this study by Schmidt and Hunter. So it ranked how predictive different types of assessment can be on in-role performance. So as you can see at the top here, we have work test samples. So those are the most predictive and work test samples tend to be tests that simulate the kind of tasks that um, candidates would actually be doing in the job. And you can see down the bottom here, we have years of education and years of experience, and those are actually the least predictive of in-role performance. So let's talk through a typical assessment process and highlight where candidates may be disadvantaged. So typically for um, most processes, people are running CV screens as a first step. So we can see here, CV screens tend to look at years of experience and education. Um, the first thing that um, I want to highlight is that your average candidate from a disadvantaged background, whether we're talking about socioeconomic or otherwise, um, will have to have overcome significantly more challenges um, to get a 2-1 from a Russell Group University than somebody who, for example, went to a top private school. So this is a really easy way to eliminate candidates from, from the process before you've even started. Um, it's also the main area where clients lose candidates through transferable skills. So it's easy to write off a CV instantly if somebody hasn't done a job as similar to the job that you're, you're looking for. Whereas in an interview or a conversation, it's much easier for that candidate to explain how their skills can transfer and, and why they may be qualified for the role. So we then can look at the next step, which is usually an unstructured telephone interview. Um, now, these don't tend to be that predictive of in-role performance. They're typically unstructured and they, there's room for a lot of bias to creep in here. So, for example, um, a candidate speaking with an accent could well be marked down, even if the role that they're interviewing for has limited or no telephone or, or client facing elements. Um, we've found that the most predictive of in-role performance is the panel interview, which tends to be a structured interview, which focuses more around a candidate's key skills and competencies. So these are really good at predicting in-role performance. Often after a panel interview, we have a meet the boss type stage, um, which again, tend to be fairly um, unstructured interviews. Um, here, there's a lot of opportunity for the same biases that I highlighted with the CV screen to come in. Um, so as an example, a candidate may have worked at the same company or gone to the same school as the boss. Um, and therefore, you know, he may lean he more heavily towards that candidate. Um, you know, and whilst these are an, a nice to chat about and, and meet and greet, they're not really predictive of in-role performance at all. Um, and then last of all, we have the reference check, um, which is, it often takes place prior to an offer. So what I've outlined here and what we can see is an, uh, an assessment, uh, assessment process that isn't particularly predictive of in-role performance and is open to a lot of bias. So we can quite easily remove the um, components that aren't predictive um, of performance 
and change the process to add as a first step um, cognitive ability tests. Now, these in the right place and used in the right way can be really helpful to determine whether a person has the right skill set for the role. We would then remove the CV screen and instead replace it with um, uh, skills based questions. So skills based, -based questions um, ask questions focused around a candidate's skills and potential rather than looking at a, scan, uh, a candidate's previous work experience and, and educational background. We're going to keep the structured panel interview in the middle um, and we would always recommend here that panel interviews uh, are run with multiple people to eliminate as much bias as possible. And then as um, a penultimate step, we look at running live tests or other in-work scenarios such as role plays, for example. Um, these can be really good for actually testing a candidate's ability to think on their feet and, and a good prediction of how they would perform in the role. Um, we would also, if there are multiple people, um, hiring managers within the interview process, we would also recommend where possible implementing scorecards and trying as much as possible to tie the interviews to your own company values. So you'll notice here that as a final step, we have um, kept in the reference checks, even though they're not that predictive um, of in-role performance. Um, and we would advise here that if you are going to use reference checks, um, using them after you've already made the offer, um, as you don't want to, to fall into any similar bias traps as we ran through earlier. But reference checks can be re a really good way of understanding better how to manage um, and work with your future hire. So absolutely recognise that this is a big departure from the norm and what businesses have been doing for years and years and years and a totally different way to look at um, interview and assessment processes and understand that for some businesses, it may be too big an immediate change. But um, if, if this is something that you're interested in, in running, we completely recommend our technology partners Applied. So Applied support with CV blind assessment processes and they provide fantastic data across the whole hiring process. Um, I'm sure Felix wouldn't mind popping a link to their website in the chat box if he hasn't already. So again, if it sounds like a little bit too much of a change all in one go, um, we recommend starting by using this approach with perhaps your early career hires. Um, with early career hires, CVs tend to be less of a safety blanket for hiring managers as candidates have less experience to look at. Um, you can then expand it to other roles across the business um, once you've demonstrated that it can work really well. Um, I mean, regardless of your approach here, there are some principles that form best practice um, in your approach to assessment that I wanted to take a little bit of time to run through. So there are four main things that um, I'd like to highlight um, when thinking about generally best practice for assessments. So it sounds really obvious, but what you're assessing is someone's ability to perform in the role. So your assessment um, process should be focused on future performance. Um, you know, what somebody's done in the past um, in terms of their roles is just one of many factors um, and assessing how a candidate would, would solve real life, life problems for the role that they're applying for can be a much better way of gauging whether that person's suitable for the role. Um, we also strongly recommend having multiple assessments, um, ideally a combination of technology and testing as well as human, and, uh, sorry, as well as human assessment. And we'd also recommend where possible having multiple interviewers at each interview. You know, this can then eliminate a lot of bias and you get the best judgment and candidate experience from that as well. Um, structuring your recruitment process and making it clear what you're looking for um, and having a scorecard for assessment can also be really helpful um, and making sure that all hiring managers and everybody involved in the process is fully trained uh, on each individual part, whether it be testing or structured interviews um, will also really help here to eliminate bias. Um, and I've talked a lot today about removing CVs, but if you think removing CVs and replacing them with skills based questions are, you know, is a step too far, we can always look at anonymizing CVs. Um, 
this can this can help take out um, bias that I spoke about initially, for example, with Sandra Barr and Miriam Urshtuk. Um, the final thing that you can look at if you're really struggling with diversity is positive action. Now, I won't go into this too far um, today, but there is a video on our diversity hub that, that explains it further. Um, so this is mandating that at least X candidates reach Y stage of your hiring process need to come from underrepresented backgrounds. And this can be a way to ensure that you, you level the playing field even further. Um, we've also found that all of the things that we're running through today actually apply just as well. Now we're living in a re remote world as they did when we were recruiting in person. So easily transferable to, to what we're looking at now. Um, I guess the final thing that I wanted to run through today was data and reporting. So Instant Impact, we love data and the more data and reporting you have, the better. So I guess the first thing to note is that it's really important to say if you're collecting data and reporting, you know, we need candidate sensitive information. And in order to get that, we need to make it clear to candidates that any data they give us will be used for reporting and to improve our recruitment processes. So once you've been given the go ahead to collect this data, ideally you'll be able to then break down things such as candidate sources by diversity, um, how candidates from different backgrounds are performing throughout the process, um, as well as how the results are changing over time. And, you know, as you continue to collect more data, you can have, you know, a, a longer view into the future about which candidates are doing better in which roles. Um, you can then, then also delve in where you need to continue making improvements in your assessment process and elements that aren't working or performing as you want them to. So again, at the moment, we often use the application tracking system called Applied that I mentioned earlier, and that can be really helpful. It provides us with all of this data and, you know, that can really help when looking at diversity perspectives and many more things. Also, by using um, a technology partner such as Applied, we can collect all of this data anonymously and therefore we're able to provide candidates with really high quality feedback on each stage of the assessment process, if they want it, of course. Um, and by improving candidate experience and our employer brand in the process. So it's a win-win. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is just continual improvement. So, you know, it's about making little changes, whether you, you're using applied or your existing ATS or just simply doing things manually, use the data and reporting that you're able to, to uh, you, that you're able to access um, to, to continue to drive improvement in your quest for an ever more diverse assessment process. Um, so that's it from me for now. So I will just uh, stop sharing. Thank you. So thank you so much, uh, Sophie, although you are still sharing. Okay. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> um, I had a couple of questions in that I just wanted to answer, answer in the moment. And um, so we got two questions in from two Janes, actually, the same, same question, which is whether this kind of process works at, at all levels or whether it's really something that's, uh, that's designed and, and only works at the, at the entry level or, or early career. Um, it's a fantastic question. We, I think it's a common misconception that these kinds of processes only work at early career. The fundamentals and the theory behind it is true across, across the board. So I think everyone would agree that it's important to have a, uh, an assessment process that's predictive of, of performance. And actually the feedback that we've got from candidates that apply using um, a, a different way where um, it's not just a, a, a click and forget um, CV application or um, they, they, they have to answer some questions around what, it, what it's like in the role. We've had some fantastic feedback and it the feedback that we get from candidates makes it clear that they find that it's the the questions help them visualize themselves in the role a little bit more. Um, they like the fact that it's diversity first, and and we make that clear on the application form, and uh, and it, it it has gone very well. And I think a lot of hiring managers, a lot of recruiters are worried that if they ask people to spend ten minutes filling out a few questions, they'll lose those candidates. My answer to them is that if if that's the case, you're going to lose those candidates later later in the process. Um, in any case, and it's up to your recruitment team to sell the opportunity to those those people. So they actually take 10, 15 minutes to fill in those those forms and the results that you'll get out at the end of the day uh, really, really will be worth it. 
Right. Well, that's that's it from from us on on there. I'm going to hand over to Mark, who is um, uh, from uh, CEO of E2W. And uh, yeah, very much looking forward to your talk, Mark. Sophie, Felix, thank you very much. And uh, uh, brilliant. It's it's we do need to make sure that all biases and things are taken out of the recruitment process. Um, I'm going to talk about a different challenge, though. Um, how to source experienced hire candidates, uh, diverse candidates in a niche market? Or let's answer the question that I hear so often or the statement that I hear so often, why aren't there any women out there? We can take biases out of the um, interview process, but unless we've got female candidates, it does nobody any good. Um, I'm qualified to talk about this because uh, for the last 20 years, I've dedicated my life, as has many of our team, to supporting and helping women to flourish and progress in their financial services careers and helping committed firms to recruit and retain more of them. It's what we do. It's all we do. Um, in addition to that, I'm an ambassador for the Diversity Project. I sit on their disabilities work stream and also help out and support their recruitment work stream. Um, I'm a co-founder of Men for Inclusion and, and I work with the WSA in helping more women who are leaving university uh, to come into the industry. So let's get started. That's me. Um, the first thing I'd say um, is firms must have an intention. There must be a commitment. Um, and by that, I'm saying they must be willing to change things. Doing things in the same old way will give the same old results. So we need to change. Uh, and change means adding cost and time to the recruitment process, something that many people have been reluctant to do. In short, we need to implement active diversity recruitment strategies. A few disclaimers before I go on. Um, I could talk for hours on this subject. I've got 10 minutes. So I will be talking in general, generalities and on key topics. So let's get started. We, we work in a niche market. Let's remember that. A market that for each experienced higher um, vacancy that we have, there are a small number of people in the world that are actually capable of doing the job. And can we agree, and for illustrative purposes, that that on average can be as, as few as 100 people? Can we also agree that the stats tell us that 80% of those 100 people, 80, will be men and 20%, 20 will be women? Can we further agree that of those 100 people, probably only 10% are active candidates actively looking for a career move. So for the average role, we have a potential of eight genuine active male candidates. We'll get more applications than that, of course, but eight genuine active male candidates. And given that women are more loyal and less likely to be actively looking for a role, possibly less than two or even zero female candidates. But the vast majority of our recruitment practices and strategies are to find and process active candidates. Candidates who are looking for a job. They're looking at job boards daily. They're looking at career pages daily and they are ready to apply. And because recruitment is measured primarily on time and cost of hire, these active candidates are often the cheapest and the quickest to hire. Demanding diverse shortlists, gender neutral job specifications, increasing the advertising budget and making the careers portal more, more um, um, talking to diverse candidates will at best have a marginal effect on the numbers, as we've seen from gender pay gap stats. What is needed is a strategy to get these, those 18 or so capable female um, females into the recruitment process to turn them from inactive to active in the process. At E2W, we break this down into stages. Identify and engage. 
That's easy for active candidates. You post a job on your careers board or on, on LinkedIn and people apply. How do you find inactive candidates? Well, at E2W, we've spent years mapping the market. And today we know where most of the women in the industry are working. We can easily engage with them as they probably know us as a firm that supports and helps women through our community, our coaching, our networking, our mentoring, and the championing we do for them. We help them flourish and progress in their careers. When we call them, it's a friendly tap on the shoulder. They don't feel the same disloyalty that they may feel if we were approaching them cold or as a recruiter. The next stage is awareness and developing interest. For active candidates, that's easy, a job spec and a careers page. The task of making an inactive candidate aware and developing their interest is more challenging. They're loyal, they're happy, they're settled where they are. They need a good reason to do something. We work hard at a corporate level with our corporate clients and with hiring managers to understand more than just the role. So the culture, the working pra practices, the career progression, the ability to do the job and deliver the goals without barriers are all important. We need to map the bigger picture with the hidden needs and aspirations of the women that we're approaching to develop their interest. The next stage is desire and action. For active candidates, that's as simple as uploading your CV and covering letter on the job portal and disclosing a few personal details. Inactive candidates often as not don't wants to, at this point, update their CV, or maybe they don't even have one. They don't want to disclose private information about themselves. They want reasons to apply for the role, reasons to be interested in the role. Maybe all they want at this stage is a chat with the hiring manager and just to share a LinkedIn profile. Our clients understand those challenges and engage with us in bypassing rigid processes to turn inactive diverse candidates into active ones. Of course, all this takes time and money. I started off by saying that there must be a commitment and an intention to seek out diverse candidates. That means the, start, the search needs to start early. The commitment needs to be at the start of the search for diverse candidates. All too often, it's left till last. The proof, of the, the, the proof, as they say, is in the pudding. On average, we are able to put forward three highly capable, qualifying and diverse candidates for each vacancy that we have worked on. Over 80% were inactive when we approached them many turned out to be the best person for the job, not just a diverse candidate. Thank you. Thanks, Mark. That was really interesting. And just as um, I did with, uh, with Sophie and, and, and the bit that we did, I'm just going to quickly ask one, one follow-on question before handing on to, to jo Joanne and, and Lauren. Um, so I think this kind of talent pool and community building that you're talking about um, yourself and the, that you've done so effectively at E2W, um, I think that's something that a lot of companies would love to replicate in-house for diverse um, talent so that they have this, this pool that they, can, that they can join. In a hypothetical world, if you were to join a, join a business or advise a business on how to do it themselves, what would the first steps you take be? Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so it, it is difficult, it's challenging, it's difficult, and for, for um, a firm, for you know, a, an investment manager to talent pool, um, it's very easy to identify the female talent. Uh, you know, that, that's easy. You can go and look on LinkedIn, there are other sources to, to identify. Actually, you know, engaging with and um, uh, doing that sustainably over time is a huge commitment 
and um, something that is easy for us to do because that's what we do. Yeah. Um, um, you know, an investment management firm can't offer to 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 mentor, to coach, to set up networking opportunities, to champion women working in in other firms. Um, they can't create that community, and not everybody can do it either. So there are firms like us that are out there that are doing it very well, that have done it for years. Um, you know, in, in, invest in, if you've got money to invest in building a community, there's one there already. And it took years and a significant amount of money. Interesting. Fantastic. Well, with that, I'm going to hand over to um, our team from Schroders, uh, Joanne and Lauren. Thanks so much for joining us today. And I hope another seamless tech trans transition over. <laughs> um. Hi, I'm just getting my slides up, so bear with me. Can everyone see the slides? Not as yet. Um. Mm, just sorry, let me just try again. Share screen. If it's not working, I've, oh, oh. Just, uh, I think we're almost good to go. Almost good to go. Now we're good to go. Fantastic. Great. I didn't want to fail on that hurdle. Um, so thank you, Felix, Sophie, um, if, uh, and Mark, um, for inviting us to speak today. Um, Instant Impact and sorry, Diversity Project for inviting us to speak on this very important topic. Um, I'm joined by Lauren Hillier, uh, not named on the slide, sorry Lauren, uh, who manages our early recruitment activity. This includes the marketing and traction piece, engagement, partnerships, the process itself, onboarding, working with hiring managers, the list does go on. The reason I mention all these areas is, areas is because today we are sharing a very small part of our inclusion journey around the assessment process in early careers. The work we are doing in these other areas mentioned is, is, is hugely important, but not being covered in this session. So I've put together some slides uh, to help keep us focused and hopefully give you an insight into the enhancements we've made to our early careers recruitment process um, and what we've found as a result of that. We've been, we've started this journey from an on assessment process perspective two years ago. Uh, no, it's eight, circa 18 months ago, sorry, and we're now in year two. Um, Lauren and I are happy to just answer questions along the way or perhaps at the end uh, in the Q&A. So what did we set out to do? Our process wasn't broken, but it needed improving. Uh, the assessments we were using were not engaging, not joined up. The output informed, uh, the output from the assessments that we had uh, informed the recruitment process in a very limited way. We were also beginning to see some adverse impact from the tests. So when we, when we kicked off the project, we had a clear strategy and identified some clear objectives for the, um, the RFI, RFP process. The challenges listed here were core to that. You know, it needed to be global, consistent, engaging, fair, inclusive, innovative, rigorous, informative, adaptable and flexible. All very, very important things. So there's a lot of information, technology partners and noise out there and working through this can be challenging. So our clear objectives really helped stop us getting blinded by, by preconceived ideas, sales pitches and helped us to select a provider that ticked all our requirements. The team selected, which was a cross-functional team and global team and the methodology we worked to also meant everyone involved in, in, in everyone involved and key stakeholders were happy with the decision we arrived at. So essentially we started a high level market overview. We then in invited eight firms to pitch and then so selected four to present. Uh, so we selected our provider and it was Aon Assessments. Sorry, just moving to the next slide. So the tool. So we worked alongside uh, the Aon team to design a new line online assessment tool to support our recruitment process. 
The focus was very much on the, in, on the talent assessments at the initial screening stage and then selective elements for further down the, uh, along the application journey. Timeframes were tight uh, in terms of delivering this tool. We needed to be ready for the graduate recruitment season. And to this day, I'm, I'm really, I'm not sure how we did it, but we did. So what does the tool do? Hopefully you get a sense of what it looks like from the slide. Um, so after initial screening by the recruitment team of the application, candidates were invited to undertake an online assessment. So the first three mobiles is the online assessment. It's one test broken up into three parts. Um, a behavioural questionnaire measuring values and potential, a bespoke chat-based situational judgment test, or questionnaire, sorry, and a logical reasoning ability test. Um, they were able to complete, or candidates are able to complete this on, an, on, on any device, including a mobile device, which our previous uh, assessment wasn't able to do. The, the tests are, are short uh, and designed to be engaging. The candidates also receive an assessment report after they complete the test. We developed specific norm groups uh, for the assessments to ensure the candidates were compared against an appropriate benchmark. And then we use a traffic light system based on assessment results to define whether candidates should be progressed to the next stage of the assessment process. So if candidates were then progressed to the next stage, the fourth mobile phone uh, gives you an, an understanding of the next stage, which is to complete an, an online video interview to, against, to assess against our values. The candidates were up, asked at, in year one up to six questions and have a limited time to respond to those six questions. Uh, for the first co cohort of candidates, this is the candidates in year one, video interviews were rated by trained hiring managers. However, in the background, um, the video interviews were also scored by expert trained AI. We decided to conduct a separate study in year one to see how humans, in this case, our hiring managers, were rating the video interview questions compared to the AI. What we found was that there was three questions out of the six which had strong alignment to the hiring managers ratings. So we used these three questions and built a score, scoring algorithm for the AI which is being used now in year two. Um, to, and, and how we're using that in year two is the recruiters are shortlisting video interviews, interviews for the hiring managers based on the AI re ratings with a spot check. So hopefully removing unconscious bias and, and a more objective way of uh, gauging interviewee performance. The AI we are using is supporting decision making, not making the decisions. I really want to be clear on that point. Hiring managers then review the, the and rate video interviews shortlisted by the recruiters in year one and this year in year two, the recruiters and AI to select candidates for assessment centres. They are reviewing the output for the assessment and the video interviews, no CVs. No CVs are seen until the assessment centre. So that gives you an overview of the tool. So the outcome. So we've, in year one, we had over 5,000 candidates applying. So lots of data, as Sophie referred to earlier, lots of data to do some analysis on. Uh, so we had, uh, and we had completion data as well um, to work from. So what did we find? So the candidates found the assessments engaging and relevant and were willing to invest the time to complete these, which was great. 90% of those, 90% completion rate um, uh, to show for that, which is fantastic. We also asked candidates to rate their experience uh, of the hiring and selection process. This has res resulted in an overall net promoter score of 37 and an re average rating of 8.2 out of 10. Um, so this suggests that candidates enjoy the process and were, were mo motivated, motivated sorry, to complete the assessments. Hiring managers were also really positive about the process. Nearly 80% of our hiring managers rated the overall early careers uh, experience or process as effect effective or highly effective, which is fantastic. With the project showing effectiveness of the AI supported interview, the team are also using that to help pre-screen on video interviews. Um, this is likely to save on recruiter time. Um, however, they will leave the, 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 the interviews and the, sorry, check the interviews and leave the pre-screen to the AI. The final decision still rests with the hiring manager. Um, so not only does the assessment process need to identify a talent for us, it must be fair, objective and have no bias towards any particular group of people. 
Um, so analysis of the assessment scores alongside de demographic information showed that there was no indication of adverse impact for either ethnicity or gender. There was insufficient data to, to examine other protected characteristics, but we are measuring those in year two. Uh, the pass rates and performance scores were similar to the majority and minority subgroups. Um, we had fewer females. Uh, we had application wise 30% applications from females, uh, but fewer females completed the assessments, although the females tend to score um, highly, slightly better than the males in the process. So having a robust online assessment enabled us to remove the CVs from the screening process. And this year we moved UCAS points as well, uh, which uh, this is for the application process for interns and graduates. So what next? A good place to wrap up. So we have used, introduced a standard approach, uh, which an ev ev evidence suggests it's engaging, which is great. There's rigor and there's no apparent bias towards either gender or ethnic minority groups, and we will stay closer to, to it for other um, groups. So we're using, so we are now using the online assessments for high volume experienced higher roles and looking to, to roll out appropriate assessments further as well. You know, we are committed to ongoing improvements and we'll continue to conduct analysis to adjust norm groups, assess adverse impact, look at scoring models uh, and, and understand and quantify the impact of any of these on our recruitment process so we can make the adjustments. The one thing I have realized is that the end product isn't actually the end. We're enjoying the journey and we need to continue to monitor, refine and make imp improvements for our tool, to our tool and other areas of our process. So thank you. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne. And really interesting to see all of that in um, in in effect and, and having, um, you know, in uh, it deployed, executed and, um, and done so well. And I, I know that you've had some great results from the back of it. I think in, in particular, I found the um, completion rates and the candidate feedback that you're receiving just just really, um, really positive. And it really goes to, to say how there's no reason why that would be something that only works for early careers where it sort of strengthens the point I was making before that candidates of all, all shapes and sizes really enjoy um, a new approach to um, uh, to that different approach to, to recruitment. And it sounds like you've done a, a really great job there um, over at Schroeder. So I've got some questions from uh, that have been coming in the whole time. First off, uh, one specific for um, yours, um, Lauren and Joanne. Um, question on why did you re remove UCAS points as a criteria? Lauren, do you want to answer that one? Yeah, sure. Can you all hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons why we um, removed the UCAS points really was to ensure that we were casting the, the net wider. We knew that we were screening out quite a few candidates that hadn't reached 128 UCAS points, which is an ABB at A level. Um, we also know that, you know, research has shown that UCAS points don't actually predict um, workplace and, and you know, adding we would then rather assess our candidates coming in using the new technology that we've got rather than screaming, screaming them out at that very first stage where they could be still very talented. They still could do a brilliant job at Schroeder's. Um, so really, it was just to cast the net wider. Also, from a social mobility um, perspective, we know that those students who have maybe not quite got an ABB um, are predominantly going to be from disadvantaged backgrounds, given not have had the same opportunities um, so that's a, another key factor as to why we removed it um, just finally we, we were previously using a contextualized recruitment tool um, which I would definitely recommend if if you're not keen to to remove your UCAS points completely that's a really good way of ensuring that you're still getting that talent and, and not screening that talent out because you're assessing them based on the context in which they receive their grades Thank you very much. And I've got a question um, for you, Joanne, which mm -hmm. is looking at the recruitment across the board, not, not sort of um, isolated. Oh, so <laughs> so we've, we've, we've got the early careers where you've demonstrated and we've, we've seen um, with a, you know, across industries, across uh, companies that you can really drive diversity there. And then you've got some of those roles that Mark, Mark was talking about before in, in contrast to that 100 people in the, 
in the UK or in the world that can do can do a role in a really undiverse uh, talent pool there. Um, the question is, with with those sort of senior senior roles, do we just give up? I so obviously, if we're looking to do it all diverse, obviously you can partner with someone like E2W. But other than that, do companies just sort of give up and say, well, we'll wait for the effect of the early careers programs to 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 come in, or or is there something that we can do um, in in the meantime to have a meaningful effect? Um, I think. It, it, we can't neglect experienced hire. It's, there's a lot of great work going on in the grassroots and, and we must, you know, keep at that to make a further difference down the line. But with, from an experienced hire perspective, there's no reason we, as I mentioned earlier, we are using these assessments in the experienced hire space. We're using in the high volume experienced hire space and we're looking at something at the more senior levels. So in terms of what we can do, those that, that engagement, those partnerships are really, really important. And it's also important to perhaps look at different programs at the experienced hire level. We have so many early careers, but experienced hire last year, we launched our returner pro program in, in conjunction with the diversity project, which really helped bring back, I mean, we we do have in terms of people coming back from from maternity leave um, a good track record here at Schroders but we're talking about people externally coming into roles who have had a gap so we've, we've got to look at programs the returner program being one and we need to look at other programs we are start, start starting other programs as well so I think the programs at the experience to higher level are really really important but you can't under, uh, underestimate those partnerships that that Mark is referring to you, you have to have those in place to, in terms to get into those um, uh, the candidates that aren't active and to have a good understanding of, of that market that you're tapping in or trying to tap into and develop. Absolutely. And one of the things that we find with some of our partners is that it's a, it can be a question of picking your battles. There'll always be those roles where, you know, there's a really shallow talent pool and you need to work, work with a, work with a partner, but there are other, there are other roles in the, as you say, the volume experienced higher realm where you can start building your, your own talent pool you can build your employer brand you can have a returners policy yeah someone's put in the chat a really fantastic point that, that we love exploring as well which is um, developing internal staff um, in roles where it is easier to get a diverse talent pool and developing them for example back office roles and then developing them into into front front um, office Definitely. roles within with internal training programs that can just be so so effective well unfortunately we oh sorry go on jo joanne no, no 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 i completely agree <laughs> completely agree is all i was gonna say <laughs> but i love being agreed with so um, that's fantastic <laughs> well thanks everyone for joining today thanks to all of our panelists thanks to all of our um attendees today um we will be sending around a follow-up email with um uh, some of the information that we've covered today, um, some of the upcoming webinars that we've got, we're running one on, which is really relevant to this, which is how companies can hire for potential rather than um, experience. We're looking at um, ways as well that um, the remote working world has affected the, the is rewriting the rule book for HR and, and uh, rewriting the, res the responsibilities there, really taking a, um, a proactive look into 2021 and beyond. Um, so we'll have sign up for all of that. Again, don't forget to fill in your feedback form and have a fantastic rest of the week. Thanks again to all of our panelists and uh, yeah, have a great day. Thank you.